Chapter 11, Recovering the Performance Management Systems. Let's go ahead and jump right in. So you have various learning objectives for this chapter. You're going to, by the time you're done reading it, you should be able to define performance, performance appraisal, explain MBO, which is management by objectives, describe multi-rater assessment and the graphic rating scale, explain critical incident appraisal, describe an essay appraisal, and the checklist method of performance appraisal. You should be able to explain the force choice method of performance appraisal, describe the work standards approach to performance appraisal, and be able to define leniency, central tendency, recency, and the halo effect. So jumping right into performance management systems. When you have a well-designed system that's implemented properly within your organization, it allows employees to know how well they're doing right now, current time, real time, not six months from now, not a year from now, but how they're presently performing. And its ability to clarify what needs to be done in order for that employee to improve their performance so they can get better, so they can do better, and possibly receive bonuses, promotions, pay increases, recognition, whatever. But they need to know what it requires to do a, a job well done. Um, so when you look at it in the form of the classroom, um, if when you're able to see that grade book, right, the grade book lets you know how well you're doing in the class. You know what it's required to pass the class and you get to see how you're tracking along the way. And that's the exact same way in, in the workforce. Performance management systems, um, you know, that allow you to tie them directly to a reward system. So for a job well done, you get rewarded accordingly. So you have to be able to understand performance in, well, in order to be able to um, act upon it. And so it's the degree, it's the extent of which um, a person is able to accomplish certain tasks that make up your job. And it reflects how well you're fulfilling the requirements of the job. If, you know, there's a job description with certain responsibilities and you're falling short, then that means you're performing to a lower standard than what is set for that job. So there's various ways to determine um, how well you're doing um, as far as performance. And job performance is looking at the net effect, not the gross effect. It's not the overarching, but the, the narrowly defined um, concept of how well you're um, applying yourself in your role, in your job, um, is looking at your abilities um, as a worker and the way that you perceive your role within the organization. So the efforts, the amount of energy that you use to complete a task, your ability are the various characteristics that you possess that um, you use to in order to perform a job. Some people have greater ability, greater skill sets than others. And then your role perception is, you know, how much energy that you put into a job is based on how you perceive your role, how you perceive that job. If you think that it's a waste of your time, then guess what? You're going to waste a lot of company time um, not doing a, a great job. If you find great value in the job and in your role, then you'll give more. You'll show up early, you'll stay late. You won't be on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter uh, when you're supposed to be working. Um, and so that ha has a lot to do with how you perceive your role. There's various environmental factors as that um, can serve as obstacles to performance. Your lack of time, or if there's a lot of conflicting demands upon your the job or you, that can serve as an obstacle. If your work facilities and the equipment are inadequate, um, if there's a lot of policies that are very restrictive, there's a lot of red tape, um, you're having to go to five people when you could really go to one. You're having to, you know, there's delays for three weeks when, you know, an answer could come in two days. That can, you know, affect your performance. Lack of cooperation from others. Um, that is big because if there's not a team effort, if there's people that are not um, willing to uh, help make sure that you're getting your task completed, if, if in order to get your task completed, it requires you know, two, three plus other people to do their job and they're not cooperating, 
that can be an obstacle. Also, the type of supervision. If you need um, someone to really uh, check in with you more because they need to sign off on certain things and they're not doing it in a timely manner, that impacts performance. At the same time, if you have a person who's micromanaging you, who's on you like a mole, right? Um, like a cheap tight suit, then that can impact your performance because they're hovering over you too much. Other things that can um, affect your performance are the temperature in the building or if you're working outdoors, if it's really hot or really cold, that can impact you. The lighting, if it's too bright or not dark enough, if it's too noisy, um, or if the, if the equipment is extremely loud, if your uh, machine or equipment is pacing too fast or too slow, if your shifts are, um, are just too erratic, or if, um, you know, you're having to, you're coming in seven days a week, um, and you're not getting any ample time off, or if they're, you know, you're working graveyard shift, and then all of a sudden you're working a double and all this other thing. So your work shifts can greatly impact your performance. And, um, you know, as the author said, luck, right? <laughs> so, you know, just, you know, you just seem to keep getting the short end of the straw. So to eliminate or minimize some of these obstacles, management is responsible for providing you with adequate work conditions and a supportive environment. If you don't have either of these, um, then guess what? The obstacles will still be there. HR is responsible for designing the um, PMS, which is the Performance Management System, and selecting the various methods and forms that will be used to appraise you in your job. They're supposed to train managers in conducting performance appraisals and maintain that reporting system to make sure that the appraisals are conducted on a timely basis and consistently um, performed by the managers so that some are not performing only some parts of the appraisal, but the full appraisal. And then, of course, HR is responsible for maintaining those records for each employee. Now, your manager is responsible for evaluating you as an employee, completing the forms um, and returning them to HR, reviewing appraisals with you, right? So they don't just do an appraisal and then it gets sent to HR and then all of a sudden you find out you're being fired and you don't know why or you're being docked pay or uh, suspended or whatever. Um, so whether you're being praised or um, being uh, punished, your, those is important to know in real time. Like there's nothing like if you take it back to being a child and you did something and um, you didn't know that your your you know one or both of your parents knew and then they waited a day to punish you. Like, huh? Wait a minute. No, you need to, I need to be punished in real time or within at least an hour or or so of the act. It needs to be in the same day. <laughs> Don't punish me a day or two later talking about this is why you're getting, no, 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 no. So it needs to be reviewed so that you know the pluses or the minuses of the work that you performed. And then, of course, managers are responsible for establishing a plan for improvement with employees. So you've been appraised and now there needs to be a plan on how you can improve. So, for instance, in this class, those of you that don't aren't maintaining a C or better, right? And I'm going through the 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 grade book with you and you're seeing where you're falling short. What I do is I establish a plan to help you catch up to improve your grade. I also for certain students I help create a system so that they learn how when best to do their work or how to strategically do their work during the week so that they can actually stay on task. So these are the various ways that that you can that I uh, you can do it in the classroom, but I'm also showing you how it's done at home, how it's done in the workplace. So the performance appraisal basically evaluates and communicates to you as the employee how you're performing on the job and establishing a plan to improve. 
Um, it's used to make various administrative decisions and it helps provide the input that is needed for determining both the individual um, training and development needs and also the organizational training and development needs. And it helps to encourage performance improvement. That's what it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to make someone then perform worse, but it's supposed to encourage you to do better. There's various uses of the appraisals information. You can be able to input it for validation of various selection procedures on, on who gets, um, you know, as far as promotions, as far as um, designing new jobs, things of that nature. Um, when you're recruiting new employees for um, uh, that's that same position. Um, but really, it's great for using it for promotion. And then, of course, to input it into the HR planning for um, future uh, use and um, how you can build out for growth of the company. MBO is management by objectives. And here you establish clear and very, very precisely defined statements of objectives for the work that needs to be done for each employee. It creates an action plan that shows how these objectives need to be achieved, how you go about achieving them. Um, and it allows the employee to be able to implement that plan into their daily um, work, right? So that you're then seeing this is what is required this is how you go about doing it. Now you have the tools in order to get the job done. And it's measuring the objective achievement. And then whenever it's necessary, you can take corrective action. You can then be able to come up with a plan B. You can help um, navigate a person a different way. And it establishes for the future various um, new objectives. So there's some requirements of that system. You have to be able to um, have objectives that are quantifiable, right? There has to be um, uh, numbers attached, so it's 25 widgets or whatever. And you have to be able to measure that. And so the fact that, um, because if you can't measure it, then how can you possibly track and appraise an employee? And you have to be able to avoid objectives that can't be measured, right? If you can't measure it, you can't hold me accountable for it. The third thing is that this MBO system has to be challenging yet achievable. It can't be so overreaching and overarching that no one can reach it, right? Um, it has to be achievable and you have to be able to express it in writing. You have to put it in writing so that employees know exactly what is expected and how they can achieve it. So that means that the, the language has to be clear and concise. There can't be any confusion. It has to be at a fifth grade comprehension, at most an eighth grade level comprehension. It cannot have a bunch of legalese and all these $25 words. It needs to have short, clear, very simple words, right? Very simple so that anyone can be able to understand it. You have to bring about participation in an objective setting process, right? Um, where everyone's minds are fully engaged in what this process is, what it means, and how it would positively impact the individual employees as well as the organization. And there has to be regular discussions between management and the employees regarding performance. It cannot be once a year. There's no way that someone can perform better and you're waiting to the year end to bring about these um, MBO systems. Like it just, it just makes no sense. Whether it's weekly or monthly or quarterly, it has to be regular. Uh, table 11.1 shows you various examples of how to improve work objects. And so a poor way is to, you know, uh, maximize production, right? But a better way of saying it is to increase production by 10% within the next three months. Um, a poor description is to reduce absenteeism. Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, how are we going to reduce it? Well, if you say instead to average no more than three absent days per employee per year, right? That's how you can reduce absenteeism. That's, um, and that's an average over an entire company, right? A poor way of saying to waste less raw material. Well, What's less? And, and you know, what? Like, that's so vague. 
but you could say to waste no more than 2% of raw material. Well, in that case, we can, we can look at that because we can measure it. You see all of these are measurable. You see that there's numbers attached to it. When you say to improve the quality of production, well, how are we improving it? Well, here's a better way of saying it. To produce no more than two rejects per 100 units of production. So for every 100 units of production, for uh, every 100 widgets that you, that you produce, that as long as no more than two of those widgets are thrown back because they were poorly produced, then that means you're improving the quality of your production, right? So these are ways of how you're there. These are quantifiable and they're measurable. See the difference? The, the, the ones that are highlighted as poor, there's no way to measure that. There's no way to quantify. It. There's no numbers attached. How can we measure, you know, the maximizing production, huh? But when you see those better descriptions allows both management and employees to be able to, to quantify it and to measure it. So here's some typical areas of objectives that supervisors need to always um, take into consideration, and this needs to be embedded within their culture. Um, when you look at production or output, it's usually expressed as a number of units per time period. And so an example of that is our objective is to average 20 units per hour over the next year. Um, when you look down at number four, personnel, is usually expressed in terms of turnover, absenteeism, and tardiness. So an example of this would be our objective is to average fewer than three days of absenteeism per employee per year. See, so here are some ways in which you can break down the objectives for a supervisor role. Now, the multi-rater assessment is a 360 degree feedback. And this is where you have managers, your peers, customers, suppliers, or even your colleagues um, with the employee being assessed and they're asked various questions to, um, in a questionnaire. And then this questionnaire um, is given to HR and then those results are then provided to the employee. Um, so you see how you have a full circle approach, right? So everyone is involved in providing feedback. Now the graphic rating scale requires the person who's doing the rating to indicate on a scale like of one to five or one to 10, where the employee rates and the quantity of work performed, how dependable they are, how knowledgeable they are of the job and how cooperative they are in working um, with other team members, with their managers, with customers, so on and so forth. When we have bars, um, that's the behaviorally anchored rating scale and that helps determine the, your level of performance based on whether or not certain um, specifically described job behaviors are present. And so, um, you know, the, those job behaviors are outlined and then how well you perform based on those and if those behaviors are present or not. There's various um, uh, characteristics or indicators tied to it. So you have job dimensions, which are broad ca categories of duties and responsibilities. Your scales are defined um, categories about specific performance. Anchors are written statements of actual behaviors. Um, and so it's indicating the level of performance on a scale opposite of that particular anchor. And so it's, it's if you literally think of an anchor, right, a boat anchor, um, you can then be able to see um, it's based on the behaviors that you're actually um, displaying in the workplace. And then there's various steps for developing the bars. Um, you have managers and job incumbents that will identify relevant dimensions for the job. And then they write behavioral anchors for each job description. And then they reach a consensus concerning the scales that um, are used right, for the values. And then they group those with the anchor statements for each scale value. Critical incident appraisal helps the person who's doing the rating keep a written record of the incidents that will show the positive and negative behaviors that you display as an employee. And they'll, um, they use the incidents as a basis for evaluating your performance. So when you flip out right at work or you throw your computer or if they turn around and see that you're help very helpful that you're nurturing 
that you're coming in and um, and you're you just seem to be the light of the um, office or the warehouse or whatever um, they're keeping track of all that when they see that you go out of your way to help a team member or go out of your way to help a customer um, they're keeping records of this that's what they're supposed to to do now an essay appraisal is where there's a written statement that describes your strengths your weaknesses and your past performance right hopefully they're using those strengths and they're building upon them and then when it comes to the weaknesses, rather than, than beat you over the head uh, figuratively about it, that they're actually then saying, okay, this person is weak in this area, so let's not keep trying to force them to do this. We may need to reroute them to do another job or find another way that they can perform this task or whatever, or put you through um, more training. And then past performance is a great way of being able to track how well you're doing now and current. Uh, time. The checklist is a yes or no, right? Um, series of questions. And so it goes about your behavior and how you're being rated. Um, and so they just go down and they, it's a yes or a no. It should be very simple. Now there's a forced choice rating. And this is where the rater is, is required to rank a set of statements describing how you carry out the duties and responsibilities of the job. And this helps eliminate the bias by forcing them to rank the statements that are indistinguishable, right? So that that person then can't, if they have it out for you, <clears throat> it doesn't allow them to, you know, it, it you they can't then try to like find a way to, to, you know, take a jab at you because the statements are so indistinguishable. They don't know how it's really describing how well you do in your job. Um, more companies should use a forced choice rating to help with the elimination of that, that bias. Um, when it comes to ranking methods, performance of you as an employee is ranked relative to the performance of other people in the company. So you have an alternation ranking, um, which it ranks employees from most to least valuable. Then there's a paired comparison where you're compared to every other employee and then force distribution requires the person who's doing the rating to compare the performance of the employees and place a certain percentage of employees at various levels of performance. So where they're ranking at 100, and, um, you know, or however they, if it, whether it's by percent or if it's by letter grade or if it's by um, color or whatever. But basically placing this certain percentage at various performance levels within the company. Um, here's a figure of a forced distribution curve, and you can see the number of employees and the performance evaluation ratings, and then you can see the, the curve. And then you see at 20%, that means you don't meet expectations. At 60%, you meet expectations. And then the curve of um, how many people that exceeded expectations, right? And so you can see that um, how that curve is and, and uh, how they went about doing that. Now, work standards approach involves setting a standard or an expected level of output and then comparing the, each employee's level to that standard, where everyone falls. And there's some advantages is that the performance review is based on a highly objective factors. Now, level, uh, table 11.7 shows you some frequently used methods for setting work standards. You can see um, expert opinion, time study, the average production of work groups. There are some potential errors in performance appraisals, you know, leniency, central tendency, and recency. Leniency is where you the, um, the ratings of your manager are grouped at the positive end instead of being spread throughout the performance scale, right? They're cutting everyone some slack. Um, that's really lazy, and it does not help um, anyone perform better because why? You're saying I'm doing a good job when actually I may not be. Central tendency is where your manager rates most employees in the middle of the performance scale. Once again, what that does is it doesn't really, it's not a real honest appraisal of how we're doing. You're just, you know, okay, I'm just going to put this. It's being on the fence. And you can't, you don't need to be at the fence. You need to be on either side of the fence. And recency is where managers evaluate you on work performed most recently. And so there could be some errors in that um, because 
if that evaluation is during a hectic time or there was something that went wrong or the manager's having a bad day, um, you know, your evaluation can be mm, a little sketchy. And so being able to have it over, you know, a, um, a period of time, right, where you can then track it, um, you can then help uh, reduce some of those errors. Um, the halo effect is when you have a person that's doing the rating and they um, allow a single prominent characteristic um, to influence their judgment. So whether it's good or bad characteristic, they'll use that to influence their judgment on each item of your performance appraisal. And um, the things that can cause errors in those appraisals can be your prejudice, your personal preference. Um, it could be your bias and even first impressions. So if you have a um, prejudice towards certain races or gender or sexual orientations or religions, that can cause a lot of errors. Um, it can be a bias where, you know, you may think that women don't, can't perform a job well, or you think that people from other countries can't, or people that English is not their first language. Um, you, that can have a lot to do with it. If you feel as though um, the person somehow didn't earn their way into the position, um, that, you know, oh, it's the boss's nephew, um, that can cause um, an error in performance appraisal. So good or bad, however you look at it, um, it can impact it. Um, you can be prejudiced toward, you know, and have this, um, this preference for people that graduated from the same college as you or went through or um, were in the same fraternal organization. And you can then, you know, turn your nose up at others. So these are a lot of potential errors. How you can overcome them is by making refinements in the design of the appraisal methods, improving the skills of your raters by providing a lot of training in um, performance appraisal methods, um, their role in the total appraisal process, um, the use of performance appraisal information and communication skills that are necessary to provide the adequate feedback that employees need in order to improve. Now there's some guidelines that managers need to use in conducting interviews, knowing the job description of the employees, um, making an evaluation based on their performance, being positive, candid, and specific, and building upon employee strengths, as I mentioned earlier, listening to employees and making sure they get adequate feedback on how the employees can improve their performance in the future. Some factors that influence the appraisal interviews can be the participation of the employee in the process, manager using positive motivational techniques, and both the manager and employee working together to set specific performance improvement objectives. Discussion of and finding solution on problems can hamper the um, you as the employee, your current job performance, and the thought and preparation the manager and employee have to devote before making that interview, um, or participating, excuse me, in that interview. And of course, your understanding with regard to the relation between both the performance appraisal and the rewards that you can receive from the organization. Um, here's some um, like steps in the, uh, the improvement plan. You know, setting performance goals, providing training to achieve the goals, assessing performance related to accomplishing goals, and setting new higher goals. So we have performance appraisal in the law. You have um, Title VII and the Civil Rights Act that, pre that permits use of a bona fide performance appraisal system. So you, it is um, allowed by law. It's not considered to be bona fide when um, there's going to be adverse effects on minorities, women, and older employees. Um, and I'm sure that this may expand unless they somehow clump uh, groups under minorities to include more than just racial minorities. Now, there's some various suggestions for making performance appraisal systems legally acceptable um, by deriving the content of the appraisal system from job analyses, emphasizing work behaviors rather than personal traits, right? Focusing more on the behaviors of the what they're doing in the job and not just a person's personality traits, you know. Um, people sometimes focus too much on those traits and not enough on the work behaviors. Um, if the person is doing a great job, 
don't you you know don't weigh so heavily on their social ineptitude or their tics or whatever. Um, ensuring that the employees, I mean, that the results of appraisals are communicated to employees. That is very vital. Ensuring that employees are allowed to give feedback during the, the interview. Um, that way you're both on the same page. Training managers and how to conduct proper evaluations. Don't just give them the form and say, go do the evaluation. Managers need to be properly um, trained on it. Ensuring that those appraisals are written, that they're documented, and that they're retained. So whether you scan them into your system or you have them in a physical file on site or off site, you need to retain them. And um, they need to be retained for the entire length of that employee's uh, job time, as long as they're working for the company. Um, and they should be retained for a certain period of time after in case there's ever a case of a lawsuit or whatever. Um, ensuring that personnel decisions are consistent with the per performance appraisals and um, in making sure that decisions are not being uh, made um, that are in direct conflict with the appraisal. So if the person actually did well and somehow you're now making a decision to demote them, whoa, whoa, there's a problem with that. And the same is true if they did not perform well and you're giving them a promotion. That is an inconsistency. So that is it for chapter 11. There's various topics in here that are weighted. So make sure that you spend some adequate time on those sections. If you have any questions, you know how to reach me, please email me in Bryant at atlantatech.edu. Thank you for everything and I will see you in the classroom.